You're watching PCTV Channel 17, proudly serving the Port Clinton City School District community. The following is a production of the Port Clinton High School Digital Media Class. Welcome to Time for Health. I'm your host, Rachel Fall, and we're very glad you've joined us. We hope you gained something from the program that helps you and your loved ones. We want to arm everyone with as much information as possible so we can all make good choices. This is not to take the place of regular medical care, so be sure to include your health care provider in on your plans and your conversations. And today, our guest is Dr. Robert Cromley. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's your first time, but I don't think it'll be your last, sorry to say, <laughs> for, your, okay. for your benefit. Um, you t I guess talk a little bit about yourself. You're um, a new family physician in the area um, and a DO, which is mm -hmm. a little bit uh, different than MD. Talk a little bit about that. Okay. So I am a, a, a DO, which means I went to uh, an osteopathic medical school. Out of the 150 or so medical schools in the country, maybe 30 or 35 are DO schools. Um, the only real difference anymore between DOs and MDs is that DOs also learn how to do uh, manipulation, which we try to, it's somewhat like what a chiropractor does, but it's different. Um, and you might have been to a DO in the past, but they didn't do manipulation because the vast majority of DOs, once they've gotten through training, don't really do much manipulation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So reg you regular went. medical school, like every, you know, MDs yep. and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Yep. I have friends who are plastic surgeons and neurosurgeons. It's the same thing. Okay. All right. Yep. And talk a little bit about your practice and um, where it's at and what you like to see and that kind of stuff. Okay. So my practice is just on the street on Jefferson Street um, in Dr. Kresge's old office underneath the water tower. Um, I, I prefer to see adults. I will see children over the age of 14, um, but my, my general focus is adult medicine um, and musculoskeletal medicine, so anybody that's had back pain, neck pain, sports injuries, things okay. like that, um, probably 30% of my practice is musculoskeletal medicine. Okay. And is that because of the manipulation yep. that you can do? Okay. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, you did a program for us at the hospital, uh, uh, Lunch and Learn, and it was about choosing wisely. And this was a program you kind of brought to my attention, and it was um, an interesting topic. And that's kind of what I wanted to cover a little bit today. So it, it, the general feel of the program was just about having kind of what I mentioned in the beginning of the program is having a good conversation and a relationship with your own doctor, the hub of your medical care. Um, yep. and that the trend is now maybe being a little more cautious or thoughtful in terms of all the testing and treatment and all that. Is that kind of? I don't know if cautious is a good word. Okay. Uh, I think that um, there's a buzzword in medicine right now, maybe in the last 10 years, called evidence-based medicine. So the majority of our decisions are being made based on you know evidence that's been recently established in the literature. Um, and what we're trying to do with the Choosing Wisely campaign is to reduce the amount of interventions and testing and things like that that might have been done in the past, which we have found with recent research to be ineffective or could actually lead to harm. Okay. So not necessarily doing everything. I, I think pendulums tend to swing. Do everything in your power. Well, hold on. <laughs> yep. And that's Exa kind of where it's swinging this way. Exactly. Yep. Um, Dr. Cover helps with a, um, a program at the hospital, and he he talked about um, he does a segment on testing and diagnostics and that kind of stuff. And he said, you know, a lot of people might come into a physician, and I, I tend to be this way, or especially for my kids. Sure. I want to be tested for everything. I don't want any surprises. Right. <laughs> Do I have this? Do I have this? You know, just and he said, you don't have enough blood. <laughs> or enough money right. to have every test for everything in the world. Mm -hmm. And that kind of reminds me of that, is that? Yeah, it's sort of along the same lines. So um, 
one of the things with the Choosing Wisely campaign is they found that first they did the science and, and found that you know if this test, if done in a thousand patients, how many people do we really help, if we help any at all? And to that end, if that test is super expensive and it only you know helps one person, or if it's 10,000 people and it only helps one person, is it really reasonable to do that test? If that test is one dollar, that's no big deal. But if that test is a thousand dollars, you know that that you might want to think again before doing that test. Right. And then we take it one step further and and try to find if there are certain populations who are at greater risk for that thing, rather than testing everybody. Okay. And it it takes time to learn all this because it takes time for that all those numbers to add up and all the research Correct. to happen. Correct. Like eggs. You know, yeah. eggs are terrible for you. Well, we do some more research. Well, they're not that bad. Oh, yeah. no, they are terrible. Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, a really good example for this is when patients come in with back pain, almost every patient that comes in with back pain believes that they need an x-ray right now. And unless you have certain symptoms, you know, back pain is one of those things that regardless of the intervention, it's probably going to get better than the majority of people within six weeks. Um, it's usually a musculoskeletal thing. It tends to be a spasm or a, a little bit of a disc issue, but as long as there's not neurologic symptoms, you know, there's no reason for any x-rays. So that's a little counterintuitive because you want to maybe go into the doctor and I want, you know, I want a, a prescription or I want a test that's going to, you know, make me assured that I'm going to feel better or something's going to be found or not found or whatever, and that's not necessarily the case. You don't want to necessarily put yourself through that, your insurance Correct. through that. Correct. And that is the, it might be the reason why, you know, some doctors feel compelled to do something. And I've actually heard mm -hmm. some physicians say, you know, a patient came to you, they want an answer or they want something to make them feel better. and. If I'm really backed into a corner and a patient wants something, I'll explain to them, you know, with clarity that this test is more of a, a therapeutic test rather than a diagnostic test, meaning I don't anticipate it to show us anything, but I'm gonna do it anyway, and we'll find out that it's, that, you know, the result was the same as what I expected it to be, okay. and you might feel better. Right. That's why it's therapeutic rather than diagnostic. And that, I mean, that's kind of a, probably a little bit of a difficult conversation or sometimes a difficult sell for people because everybody's kind of used to going in and getting exactly. prescriptions or whatever. And that was one of the other um, examples that you talked about was antibiotics. My whole family just went through sickness, some of us twice. And, you know, after a while, I'm like, oh, do we need? I'm like, but, I mean, generally speaking, you know. Yeah. Things kind of run their course, or with some conservative treatment, you know, fluids, rest, exactly that kind of stuff. Exactly. That that's one thing. So I'll back up one step. That's that's one thing that generally um, happens quite a bit when when patients come to see physicians is they come in with a certain expectation. I have these symptoms, so when I go to the doctor, I'm going to tell him or her that I need an antibiotic, and that's not always the case. Um, and often when they leave the physician's office without an antibiotic, they feel like the physician is either not a good doctor or they didn't do what they, what they, what they felt they needed. Um, and granted, you know, in a five minute conversation, it's tough to have that conversation. Right. Um, it's tough to get to that point to where the patient really trusts and buys in with and what the physician says and understands. And then the, and the same thing with the physician, they need to understand where the patient's coming from. So um, what I referenced in the Choosing Wisely campaign was the sinusitis. It's a really common thing that happens, and 90% um, of the time that sinusitis happens, it's a virus. And there's no amount of antibiotics that's going to treat a right. virus because they don't work against viruses. Right. Um, so if you think about that, 90% of the time, that's only one in 10 people are, are going to get an antibiotic and right. actually need it. Though the reason why they're pushing for this, one of the one of the biggest things in um, the Choosing Wisely campaign, is because you know millions of people get antibiotics for sinusitis every year, and there's no need for it. And they don't need it. And that I think Dr. McLean did a program a while ago about how 
um, that that has long-term bad implications. People getting antibiotics when they don't need them, and of course we all we all take them like we're supposed to till <laughs> they're <laughs> till they're gone. Yeah. Not just when I start feeling better, of course. Right. So that's one of those things that ends up having a uh, a bad implication when you're trying to do something good or you think you're doing the right thing. And exactly. So the biggest concern with overuse of antibiotics is that bacteria learn the mechanism of action of the antibiotic. So if it's an antibiotic that, that ruptures the cell wall, some bacteria can learn how to defend against that, gotcha. either developing a, a stronger cell wall or developing some sort of um, response that helps turn off the antibiotic. And if you take antibiotics and expose these bacteria to the antibiotics enough, um, all the all the bacteria is going to learn all of our our, our tools. Okay. Um, and so come back smarter. And come Sounds back and creepy, smarter. But it's true. Yep. It, it's well, it's not that it's creepy. It's actually happening. I mean, they talk about superbugs in the news all the time because um, they've been exposed to too, too many things. Like MRSA is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Methicillin meaning it's resistant to methicillin. It's a stronger bug than a re than regular Staphylococcus. Gotcha. Yeah. So it grew to understand that antibiotic or whatever, and now it's, it won't touch it. Correct. Okay. So all of this, um, we're just got another minute or two before we take a break, but all of this is, is not necessarily, you know, don't have an antibiotic or don't get an x-ray, but about choosing wisely and learning the questions to talk to your doctor about or right. asking questions of your doctor, listening maybe for a different point of view. Mm -hmm. That's what it's kind of typically about no matter what, not just antibiotics or back pain, but I know there's a whole host of other topics that we, we can and we might get to. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Okay. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back. talking about choosing wisely. Um, uh, it, it, it's a campaign from uh, family medicine, kind of the family medicine world. More than just family medicine, it was originally started by the American Board of, in, of Internal Medicine, but then the majority of all the medical colleges okay. got on board with it. And it's about having conversations with your doctor and taking time with your doctor and asking questions and, and listening to the answers as well. Correct. Um, as a physician, how you know, how would you prefer your patients to approach an appointment with you? I'm sure a lot of us probably do, you know, research on the internet. These are my symptoms. Oh, I have this, this, and this, and this is what the kind of treatment I'm supposed to have. So let me just <laughs> enlighten you about that when yep. I come in. <laughs> Self-diagnose and yeah. just ask for the treatment. Right. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a good question. So maybe 10 years ago, um, Jerome Groupman, MD, wrote a book He's a Harvard professor, and he um, just realized that um, a lot of the the issue that he was seeing with his patients was that you know he's a really intelligent physician, and he you know is a thought leader in his field, but his patients would still come to him questioning you know his his, <laughs> his sort of plan of care for them, and he thought, what is it that's that's causing this problem, and um, he eventually um, wrote this book called How Doctors Think. It's, it's a book that he originally wrote for patients to help them understand why a doctor comes to his or her conclusions. Um, but it also is a good book for physicians to read because it sort of helps close the gap between you know where the patients are coming from and where the physician is. Okay. I know I take for granted the, the amount of training that I've had. Um, and I often forget that the patient doesn't have this training. Right. So um, what's really important for the patient and the physician to come to the table um, with an open mind and having a dialogue about what the symptoms are, what the history is, 
and what the possible diagnoses okay. can be. You mentioned uh, history, and that was one of the things um, that Dr. Cover mentioned. You know, you want to be tested for everything. Right. Well, let's maybe just narrow a few things down to what you're maybe predisposed to because of your family history. Is that generally an okay place to start? Well, it, that that is definitely situational. So everything um, that we do just depends on a constellation of symptoms. So if you come to me with a certain set of symptoms, say a headache, um, there is you know, certain types of headaches like migraines, cluster headaches, tension headaches, and others. And based on when your symptoms occur, how often they happen, what makes them better or worse, um, if they're associated with any signs or symptoms, that helps us sort of focus our, our, um, our path. So if your headache is a three out of 10 and it only happens every month and only lasts for 15 minutes and Tylenol makes it go away, there's no reason for me to do a CAT Any scan or an MRI, yeah. right? Um, but if it's the worst headache you've ever had and you're starting to have numbness or tingling in your hand, that's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem and we might need to do some testing. Okay. Yep. And I like, um, you know, how you said it's, it's dependent on so many different things and that was one of the themes you talked about in that luncheon was there's not just black or white. You Correct. know, you have a headache, this is what you do. Well, what is your headache like? You know, what comes before, what comes after? Your headache isn't necessarily like your neighbor's headache, so your treatment is not necessarily going to be the same thing that your neighbor had for a headache. Correct. I think that's the main difference of what the, the medical training helps provide is it, it's not just a matter of learning the medical facts. In my opinion, that's the easy part of medical training, um, even though it's very difficult. Right. <laughs> The, uh, the medical facts is, is the, only the first step because there are a lot of things that present very similarly. And um, being able to differentiate between those things is the difference between the physician, hopefully, and the patient. The patient will read about their symptoms online and if Google, you know, the top Google search you know, gives these three things as a possibility, that patient is going to be convinced that those three things are right. what they may or may not have. Um, and it's my job to explain to them why it's not those it things. It may or may not be that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and a couple of the other things that um, were talked about, not even necessarily um, conditions, but somebody brought up, somebody asked you about diet pop and how you know, diet pop is generally not real good for you. And somebody said, well, at some hospitals or different places that are trying to be healthy, all they offer is diet pop. Right. Well, the greater, you know, the greater good, kind of explain that a little bit. Like. Yep. So nothing, nothing is black and white. A lot of patients come to us thinking that this is good and this is bad. And it's not that it's good or bad. It's just that it's more, I like to, draw a picture and say it's more like a continuum. This is, we have the one extreme, and this is where we have the other extreme, and everything is somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. So diet pop for somebody who has diabetes, diet things are more essential for them because you don't want the extra sugar in your diet. However, for somebody that doesn't have diabetes, it's not as necessary. A lot of the scare of whether diet pop causes cancer and things like that, that came out in the 80s and 90s, um, has been found to be generally unfounded, um, meaning that it doesn't cause an increase of cancers and things. If it did, we wouldn't sell it. Right, 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 right. right. Um, but there is some research that shows that people who drink more diet pop tend to be heavier mm -hmm. and tend to struggle with losing weight a little bit more than people do not, who do not drink diet drinks. So using that knowledge, that might motivate someone to right to not drink it as often so it yep. depends on what your what your issue you know if you have diabetes you don't have much you know you yeah. have a choice right low fat diet i always think of people who are on a like a, maybe a cardiac low fat diet so everybody thinks well that's probably just really darn healthy well yep. there's good fats there's bad if that's not your issue and that's where the whole conversation with your doctor is yep and spending time yeah the actually the, the low fat diet's another big fad right now your body needs a certain amount of fat and if you don't get enough fat your brain is going to tell you to keep eating until it gets enough fat. 
you need fat to, to build cell walls, you need fat to, to build um, brain tissue and neural tissue. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that fat, you're doing yourself a disservice. So a lot of women especially tend to go towards the low fat, no fat foods. It's actually a problem. If you eat a little bit of fat early on in your meal, it triggers a, a satiety center in your brain that says, hey, I have enough fat, so good. I'm good. But certain kinds of fat. Not like if you certain eat your cheesecake fat. first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not yeah. necessarily what you're yeah. talking about. That's why the, you know things like nuts are a really good snack. Yeah. Just a handful of nuts can satisfy you for hours. Okay. It takes long for them to be digested, and, and it's got plenty of fat and protein. Not much sugar. What are some of the other things that people come in with or some of the topics that you um, kind of would wish people would know about or how things that you'd like to, them to ask or not ask or about all this stuff? Like what are common things that people are misguided on or? Hmm. I think probably the, one of the more common themes that I see is People often want the cause or the solution to something that they're experiencing to be more complicated. Hmm. They often will say, you know, you know, if there's, um, I have all these symptoms, it has to be, you know, I have to have a, a disc disease or I, I must need back surgery or an MRI because of, you know, these hmm. symptoms. And it quite often is not quite that complicated and something that we can figure out between the history and the symptoms and the physical exam. Um, and they're often let down by the fact that it's not complicated. Um, so I think um, I have a pain management physician on here. And when you talk about pain, you know, low back pain is something that you had mentioned earlier. And um, you know, if you have low back pain, but it doesn't necessarily impact your functioning, that's another thing. All these things, whether they, like the headache, yeah. you get it for 15 minutes, it doesn't really bother you versus the person who's down for the count. Low yep. back pain's the same way. Yep. I see back pain in, man, I would guess probably 25% of all of my patients. <laughs> and everybody that comes in with low back pain, they all think that it's the worst possible back pain they could possibly have. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and I don't belittle the fact that the back pain in some cases can be impairing. Um, I try to explain to them you know, what the actual cause is, um, draw a picture or you know, show them an x-ray, things like that, that explains the anatomy and why I am concerned or why I'm not concerned about what these signs and symptoms may be. Um, and sort of talk about the literature and talk about um, things we can do to make it better, exercises they can do to make it better, um, and things like that. That was another thing you mentioned in the lunch and learn was about osteoporosis and screening for that and what you do for it and what you don't do for it. And you said the best thing is walking. Correct. <laughs> yes. That this, that's a really good segue from what I was saying earlier about things being more complicated. It is my feeling, and you know, generally in the medical profession, if people ate better food, walked a little bit more, spent a little bit less time sitting, weighed a little bit less, that would solve a lot of the problems that we deal with on a regular basis. Hmm. The number one killers being heart disease and stroke and cancer, these things can all be reduced by being a little bit healthier. Um, so. You know, those aren't particularly complicated. Not, not complicated how to prevent those things. I mean, some people just have familial diseases where no matter what they do, they're going to get a heart attack at a young age because of the way right. their body processes cholesterol or something. But those are very rare. Okay. So, um, you know, people can live long, healthy, happy lives without ever seeing a doctor. I know I'm blaspheming, but <laughs> if you eat a healthy diet and, you're, and you're, you stay thin and are in exercise, you don't really need me. Right. Except for having access to some certain screening tests. Right. Okay. Um, you mentioned though walking and eating healthy. This was, um, we have just about a minute left, but somebody in the luncheon asked about w water. We were talking about drinking water, about that's kind of one of the things in there too, about how good water is for you. But then, mm -hmm. not in every case, there are people with 
water retention issues or people on dialysis. So that's, again, you know, you think water, that water's good for everybody. There is such a thing as too much of a good thing. Yeah, yep. necessarily. And that's probably the case for everything. And that's why we need to ask. Have a conversation <laughs> with your physician. Have a conversation with your physician. Yep. All right, thank you very much. Sure. All right, we're gonna take another break and we'll be right back. Thank Dr. Cromley for being our guest today, talking about choosing wisely, some questions to ask your doctor, some approaches to take, and some things to think about. Um, great information to share um, or to think about for yourself. Um, to reach Dr. Cromley at his office, it's at 730 Jefferson Street, right across from the high school here. Um, and the office number is 419-301-4335. So if you ever have feedback about a program or a suggestion for a future episode, please let us know by sending a note to Time for Health, 615 Fulton Street, Port Clinton, Ohio, or you can email Mrs. Pels at the high school, C-P-E-L-Z, at pccsd-k12.net. So think about all the things that we talked about, um, different conditions, different tests, different things to think about, um, whether it's helpful for you or maybe you know somebody that might uh, benefit from the information, be sure to share it with them. And until we meet again, I encourage you to make time for health. <laughs>